Good morning, everybody. It's Think Green Thursday again. Um, and we've got with us our favorite bird expert, Lynn, Lynn Mosley, also one of our master gardeners. And she is going to tell us about the crazy cribs of birds. And uh, it'll, it'll be fascinating. I know you will all be fascinated. So um, thank you, Lynn, and just dive in. All right, everyone. I hope, uh, will you give me a thumbs up if you can all see the screen? Okay, good. Well, um, it's so nice to be with you virtually. I, I so uh, regret that we can't be doing this in person because I would bring a whole bunch of actual bird nests from the ornithology lab at Guilford College and have them right there at the front of the auditorium for all to see. Um, it's, there's really nothing like having these, these uh, objects in person to examine, maybe some other time, but um, we'll, we'll deal with photographs this time. I'm going to talk today about nests, eggs, and the whole uh, reproduction process really in birds. Um, I think this is important for uh, folks who are interested in gardening for a number of reasons. Birds, first of all, are the most common group of vertebrates uh, in the terrestrial landscape. They're more common than amphibians, reptiles, or mammals. And they do many ecological functions that are critical to uh, nature's proper functioning. For instance, birds eat so many insects that would otherwise eat our plants, or us for that matter. Um, they, for, here's a good example that I like to give. One pair of chickadees raising a clutch of eggs needs 5,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to raise that brood. And if you consider that chickadees are our smallest, one of our smallest nesting birds, just imagine the impact on caterpillar populations and insects that uh, all the birds in your backyard have when they're feeding chicks. Birds also are critical for spreading um, seeds, seed dispersal in forests and hedgerows and so forth, and propagating those native plants that are part of natural succession in uh, um, all habitats. Um, birds are part of nature's food web. They are prey and they are predators and they're important links in that food web. Not to mention the fact that they're beautiful, they have beautiful songs, and we love them in our backyard. So that's, a, that's my justification for sharing information about birds with master gardeners. Anyway, let's move on. Um, at this time of year, it's perfect time to be talking about avian reproduction, nesting, building nests, laying eggs, and so on. I get calls and emails all the time uh, people find a nest in their backyard and say, what kind of nest is this? Or they find an egg on the driveway or uh, in an abandoned nest. Who laid these eggs? Or suddenly a nest in a bluebird box that they've been monitoring is empty and it seems like it's, it's too soon for the chicks to have fledged. What happened to those chicks? So it's, it's uh, their questions that surround the uh, breeding season that um, people who are outside and in their gardens a lot want to know. So here's some of the things that we'll talk about today. There are really five parts that I've divided the breeding season into. We'll talk about nests and um, the types of nest materials used, egg laying, incubation, hatching, and parental care. And during this, this uh, presentation, I'll be raising issues about how, like how birds make nests and why, why are there so many different kinds of nests? And of course, if we were in person, we could have a little discussion about these things, but as it is, you'll just have to bear with me and I'll answer my own questions. So there you go. As far as um, nest types is are concerned, this is the first thing that we'll be talking about. There are so many different kinds of nests that birds make. They use different materials ranging from 
sticks and branches to mud to spider webs, and then the locations where they place their nests vary as well from bare ground to typical trees and shrubs. Some birds make floating nests like loons and grebes. Um, others nest in cavities or burrows. And so all this makes for a great variation in the uh, nesting habitat of birds. There are almost as many different uh, answers to the questions of what do they make their nest with and where do they nest as there are species of birds. So in step one, the nest building process, um, as I said, there's great variation in nest types ranging from no nest at all to extremely complex nests, nests that are amazing either in size or the difficulty of construction. So we'll just do a little survey of the different nest types ranging from simple to complex. And the first type, the minimalists, as I call them, would be those birds that just plop their nests right on the ground or on another surface, as you'll see in a minute. This is a common nighthawk. I used to see them when I was walking out to my turn colony on the Outer Banks. I studied least turns when I was a graduate student. And at the edge of the turn colony, one day, I saw two round objects that just seemed to stand out a little bit from the shells and, and pebbles on the surface. And there were two common nighthawk eggs just right there. It looks like maybe she had moved a couple of rocks out of the way to get a perfectly bare spot, but maybe she just found the bare spot and decided that was going to be her nest. Nighthawks are related to whippoorwills and um, chuckwills widows, if you're familiar with them. And we have them at this time of year. They, they uh, like to nest on rooftops, and you can hear them in the evenings giving their pink call. Here's one of my favorite examples of a bird that makes no nest. This is a bird that you might see if you go to Hawaii or South Pacific Islands. It's the beautiful white tern. The nest is a branch, hopefully a flat branch, because that egg has to not roll off in order to be successful. And when that chick hatches, like you see in the lower left corner, that chick has to hold on, grab on, so it doesn't fall off. And they do fall off once in a while, both the eggs and the chicks. Here's the world's most wonderful bird. This is the least tern, the bird that got me my PhD. So we all love it. <laughs> and they kind of were a little bit of an intermediary. They made a scrape in sand. They nest on open beaches and um, they just sort of pivot around in a circle, kicking sand backwards with their feet and hollow out a very shallow depression. This is actually rather deep for most least terns and that's their nest. And I took these pictures, these were from my graduate school days, showing how incredibly camouflaged a simple scrape can be if you're nesting on a proper substrate. Uh, this was an old uh, dredge spoil deposit site. The Corps of Engineers keeps the shipping channel open by depositing dredge material, and it actually makes habitat for nesting birds. You can see how it takes a practiced eye to avoid stepping on the nests of the birds you're trying to study. That would not be good. And here's what happens after um, about 21 days. I think the uh, prize winner for the no nest category would have to be the emperor penguin. You may have seen a number of nature shows about them. They don't make a nest. They don't even make a, they don't even use a bare patch in the ground. They use the feet of the male bird to incubate the egg while the female goes off for five weeks, five weeks folks, to replenish her energy stores that she's directed to producing that one nice size egg, leaving the male <clears throat> behind <clears throat> on the ice pack in Antarctica during, wait for it, the Antarctic winter. I think that's just the most incredible story of an adaptation to harsh natural conditions that I've ever heard. And so the, the nest is actually the top of the, the male's feet for incubating the egg. And then the female comes back and takes a turn while he goes off after the egg hatches. 
Well, a lot more familiar to those of us in a Piedmont, North Carolina area would be nests made of grass and sticks. Much more common um, in a typical backyard habitat or suburban habitat. Open cup nests are typically made of grass and sticks, and that's what most of our native songbirds produce. Robins, cardinals, brown thrashers, et cetera, et cetera. I happen to have a brown thrasher nest here, which Chris collected when the ladybank's rose in rose in the um, arbor gate was pruned just the other day. And uh, I don't know how well you can see this, but it's a typical cup nest with um, a nice space in the center and grass and sticks and a few leaves around it. Um, some cup nests are arched over as the illustration on the bottom right shows meadowlarks nest on the ground and to help make their nest inconspicuous they actually make a little roof over the top uh, oven birds do the same thing they're a warbler that nests in our deciduous forests and they make a roofed over nest out of uh, dead leaves so this is probably the most common nest for our area stick nests um, there are birds that really don't use much grass in their nests, but uh, make their nests solely of sticks with maybe a little bit of a softer lining in the very middle where the eggs go. This is a portion of a great blue heron colony outside Greensboro. They're colonial nesters. These long-legged, long-beaked, long-necked birds actually nest in trees, which I find to be quite a balancing act. And uh, they'll put several nests in the same tree made of sticks, they're very conspicuous as a result. I have to point out the uh, record holder for the largest nest on record, at least in this continent. Bald eagles um, make nests that they use for years, the same pair, and they make for life, we use the same nest year after year after year, adding to it each time with branches and sticks. The largest one on record was nine and a half feet in diameter and 20 feet tall. And then there's the famous one in Ohio that was used for 34 years continuously. And when it finally fell, it weighed almost two tons. That's quite a stick nest. Um, another favorite example of a bird that uses sticks in its nest is the chimney swift. These fly overhead twittering all day long, but also in the evening when <clears throat> insects are in flight in the air. And um, they make their nest in a chimney or um, other kind of uh, enclosed area. A hollow tree would have been their natural habitat. And these little sticks are glued to a vertical surface, as you can see on the left, by the bird's saliva. Now, here's the, here's the catch. When a chimney swift takes off in the morning, it does not land until it comes back to the chimney at night. So how do they collect the sticks, you wonder? And here's the neat thing. They, they do not land, they do not perch in a tree, they break off the tips of branches as they fly by. So they are totally aerial until they return to their chimney, either to roost at night or to um, incubate. Of course, there is a parent on the nest while one is feeding. <clears throat> Mud nests. There are a number of birds that use mouthfuls of mud to build their nest. This is a picture of a barn swallow. It has gone to the edge of a creek or a river or um, stream or somewhere and gathered mouthfuls of mud to bring back and one mouthful at a time it's deposited the uh, mud so as to build up a nest that might be four or five inches high um, flamingos are famous for doing this and i particularly like the way that these long-legged birds make their nest up off the ground so they don't have to crouch down so low to sit on the eggs. Pretty smart. Now, robins, one of our most common nesting birds in the backyard, certainly have a, a 
nest of grass and sticks, but they reinforce the base of the nest with mud. And if you've ever picked up an old robin nest after the leaves have fallen off the, the shrubs and trees in the winter, you may have noticed how heavy it is. And that's because it's not just uh, dead grass and sticks. Nests of plant down are made by some of the smaller species of birds. There's some warblers and finches that use plant down. And goldfinches, for example, delay nesting in our area because they have to wait until there's enough thistle down that has been produced by thistles growing up, flowering, and then going to seed. So after that happens, then they're able to get enough nesting material to actually make their nest. You can see how tightly constructed these nests are, especially the yellow warbler on the right. They're so well made that um, the, the story in ornithological circles that you always tell at this point is that if it happens to rain and the nest isn't protected from rain falling into it, it's so tight that rain will puddle up in the nest and won't drain out. So it means that those parents really need to be attentive to the eggs and chicks when it's raining. Some birds use lichen to cover the outside of their nest with. Um, hummingbirds are notorious for uh, lining their nest and covering the outside with lichens. That's a hummingbird nest on the left. You can see it's not even two inches in diameter. They are tiny little constructions, so delicate, and the nest actually expands when the mother sits on the, the eggs. If she's out foraging, for example, and comes back, she'll settle down in there and kind of move her body around and the nest will expand to accommodate the shape of her body. That's a, a blue-gray gnatcatcher on the right. It, it's a small songbird that visits us in the summer and it just um, has a nest that's slightly bigger than a hummingbird nest. Feather nests. Um, it's well known that ducks and geese, uh, females who are the only ones that make the nest in these species, pluck the down from their own breasts to make a nice, soft, warm covering uh, for the eggs. And eider ducks, the nest on the left is from an eider duck that next nests in the North Atlantic. Um, their feathers are known to be the uh, best Nat natural insulation in the world. There's actually an industry in Iceland and uh, Scandinavia and the uh, and Canadian, uh, Canadian Arctic to collect the uh, used nests from eider duck nests, the used down to use in all kinds of down clothing and so forth. A little closer to home is the tree swallow. This is a tree swallow nest on the right this picture was taken inside a bluebird box. Uh, tree swallows are moving into our area. 30 years ago, they didn't nest here in the Piedmont of North Carolina, and, and they're becoming much more common as cavity nesters. We'll say a little bit more about that later. Some of the most interesting nests in the bird world are called suspended nests, and there are two types, pencil and pendulous. A pencil nest is one that is uh, relatively compact and it's suspended on two sides, both ends, from uh, the end of a branch or limb. In North America, kinglets, blackbirds, the northern perula, which is a warbler, and Acadian flycatchers make this type of nest. And that uh, the one on the right with the northern perula is really quite an amazing construction for a tiny little bird. But the pendulous nests are really, I think, the most um, spectacular in terms of the uh, technique to actually make the nest from scratch. In our area, Baltimore Orioles are really the um, main species that uses one of these. But in the tropics, there are some additional ones 
look at the Aura pendula. That's a bird related to blackbirds. It's a big bird, about the, almost the size of a crow. And if we were in person, I would ask the audience, why in the world do you think these birds go to the trouble of making such a nest? It's very difficult and time consuming to make. I've even heard that sometimes the birds, as they construct the nest, get their feet tangled in their own nesting material. And if they can't extract their feet, they die. So the answer to my own question is, it's a remedy to counteract the effect of snake predation because most snakes are too heavy bodied to get to the terminal end of a branch and then lower their body all the way down to where the entrance would be. And the entrance would be way down here at the bottom of that uh, expanded part. Cavity nests is, are kind of a different category. They can use all kinds of the different materials I mentioned. But the point is that there are certain birds that do not nest in the open. They don't make open cup nests in a tree or shrub. They have to be in a cavity. And that cavity can be in a tree, a cliff, a burrow, or a human-made nest box. And that's, of course, a bluebird nest. I think it's uh, good to know that there are two kinds of cavity nesters. There are birds that can make their own cavities. And in our area, there's only one main kind of primary cavity nester, which includes all the woodpecker species. That's a pileated woodpecker in the picture there. Some nuthatches can make their own nest if they have a nice, fairly soft, um, say, dead snag to use where the wood isn't quite so hard. Woodpeckers, they can pretty much burrow into anything. So they're the primary cavity nesters. And ecologically, they're absolutely critical because they're the birds that make the cavities that the second type of cavity nester, secondary cavity nesters, use. So before people started putting up nest boxes for birds, every single cavity nesting bird, bluebird, for example, um, Carolina chickadee, tufted titmouse, they all had to use a leftover from the previous year woodpecker nest. And in my list here on the screen, these are species of birds that you can find in a bluebird box. So if you have a bluebird box in your yard, or perhaps you help monitor a bluebird trail, um, you should be able to identify each of these six kinds of nests. Bluebirds, Carolina chickadees, Carolina wrens, house wrens, brown-headed nuthatches, and as I call it, the new kid on the block, the tree swallows. The reason I put optional next to the wrens and the nuthatches is that they can nest outside of a cavity. Um, uh, sorry, they can, the Carolina wrens can nest outside of a cavity, like in a windowsill. The brown-headed nuthatches are optional secondary nesters because in the right conditions, they can make a nest in soft wood on their own. In addition to those species that you can find in um, a bluebird box, owls are frequently second, secondary cavity nesters, as well as starlings and parrots. The reason that bluebirds almost went extinct in eastern North America was because starlings outcompeted them for secondary cavities. Until humans came along and constructed Bluebird boxes that had entrance holes too large for star or too small rather for starlings to get in. Um, bluebirds were in a sad state and they were disappearing. The final category are birds that nest in uh, burrows in cliffs or banks or whatever. Here you have a kingfisher on the left. All kingfishers around the world um, make burrows sometimes as long as six to eight feet deep and bank swallows. Uh, they're a swallow found out west. Feel free to enter any questions you might have in the chat box and we'll take a, a chance at the end to go over those questions. Um, last thing I want to say about nests has to do with advantages of the nest. Just to um, complete this thought, certainly nests provide protection for the eggs and young. It makes them cryptic so that it's harder for predators to find the eggs and the young. 
it's where the development of occurs. And by having a nice, well-built nest, um, the microclimate is actually modified. So those eggs stay warmer uh, out of the rain and so forth. Of course, if you're not making any nest at all like that um, common nighthawk, that egg has to be incubated constantly. And then the nest also serves as a focus of parental activity so that the parents can coordinate bringing food and incubation for those species that share incubation between males and females. So it serves a lot of um, functions in addition to just holding the eggs and the chicks. But wait, why are there so many different kinds of nests? Why didn't all birds just decide, let's build this kind of nest, it's easy? Well, there are lots of answers to this question. Um, in different habitats, different types of materials are available. And I like to point out that unless, um, oops, unless there were many different types of nests, a nest predator could learn what this one kind of nest looks like. And all it would have to do would be to go around its habitat and take all the eggs or chicks out of that one type of nest. Having different nest construction types makes it harder for predators to learn how to recognize a nest as something that might have food uh, in. So um, those are some of the reasons. Oops. Step two in the reproduction process then proceeds to egg laying. The nest is built, the parents are, have formed their pair bond, now it's time to, time to lay the eggs. Uh, the incredible edible egg. Great variation occurs in nature among eggs. Eggs vary in how many a species lays, typically what's the, the standard number for different species? What color are its eggs? Is it uh, a plain egg or does it have a pattern of different colors on top of the background? What shape are the eggs? And what is the length of time between the laying of successive eggs? How much time does it take after a bird lays one egg until the next egg is ready to be laid? So we'll answer some of these questions. Um, you, everybody should understand that a bird can lay only one egg per day, that it is physiologically impossible for a bird to lay more than one egg a day. And here's your anatomy lesson for the day. This is the reproductive system of a female bird. Whether you're an eagle or a hummingbird, all eggs go through the same process in the same amount of time. And I don't need to go through the whole thing, but just look at the figures in red. If you add up how much time the egg spends in each, time, each part of the oviduct and then down in the uterus where the shell is applied as well as pigments, you come up with 24 hours and a few minutes. And even if two mature ovums, now the ovum is the yolk of the egg, okay? and it's fertilized down here. So this one yolk is actually the largest cell, single cell in the world, and it gets fertilized here. Even if two ova accidentally, so to speak, were released at the same time, would two eggs be laid? No, you would have a double yolked egg produced, but not two eggs, okay? So a bird can only lay one egg a day. They may take two or three days, like in the larger birds of prey, between eggs, but you know that there will be only one egg a day in that bluebird nest, right? I think it's fascinating how much the number of eggs in species of birds can vary. Um, these, <laughs> these pictures show one extreme wood duck nest with 15 or more eggs i could only count up to 15 and an ostrich nest this is in um this is in africa and this is not these eggs were not laid by one female there were four to seven uh ostrich hens that contribute to laying eggs in one nest but the fascinating thing is that of those say six or seven 
hen ostriches that laid in this nest, one is dominant to all the others. And when she lays her eggs, she kicks out the others. So, haha, -ha, it's good to be dominant. Let's start at the other end of the extreme. There are several species of birds that uh, physiologically produce only one egg per year, sometimes only one egg every other year. The large penguins, like the emperor penguin, that makes sense because how could that daddy bird incubate more than one egg on its feet at a time? And uh, puffins, they're um, seabirds of the uh, North Atlantic and Pacific. Most albatrosses, um, some of the smaller ones might lay two, but most of the big albatrosses lay just one. And the kiwi, the kiwi is a flightless bird of New Zealand. And it's famous among ornithologists because of its amazing egg. Um, oops, where's my kiwi picture? Oh, we'll get to that in a minute, I guess. Um, clutch size of two. Pigeons and doves always lay two eggs. Hummingbirds always lay two eggs. There are occasional hummingbirds that will have three in the nest, but that's really rare. It's like less than 1% of all hummingbird nests. Four eggs. <clears throat> Shorebirds nesting on the ground in open habitats. <clears throat> Many species of shorebirds will lay four eggs. And I want you to notice how the narrow end of each egg is pointed towards the middle. That's the most efficient packing or spacing of the eggs to make them um, concentrated in a, as small a space as possible for proper incubation. So birds like killdeers and plovers, um, some sandpipers, a lot of shorebirds lay uh, a clutch of four. Songbirds, our typical backyard birds, robins, bluebirds, etc., typically lay four to six eggs. Chickadees and wrens can lay eight, nine eggs occasionally, but four to six is pretty typical for most songbird species. The really large clutch sizes occur in owls, uh, marsh birds called rails, the group that includes chickens, grouse, pheasants, and so forth, and ducks. Um, snowy owls are an interesting oddity among um, nest owls in general. First of all, they nest on the ground, and that's because they nest in the high Arctic where there are no trees. And second of all, they can lay a bunch of eggs. Um, so it's an interesting interesting question to ask, why is there such a variation in the clutch sizes of birds? Thank you. Um, one of the reasons is how much effort it takes to raise a chick or chicks. That little ostrich, sorry, uh, albatross, I'm going to take a sip of water, excuse me. That albatross is the famous albatross you may have heard in the news, Wisdom the Albatross. She was banded when she had a nest that the first uh, people to band her discovered. She was sitting on a nest at the time, so she was an adult. That was 70 years ago, so we know she's over 70 years old. And <clears throat> it takes 18 months to raise that one chick. So you can imagine <clears throat> if she had two chicks, they would never both make it anyway. <clears throat> so uh, it, if re reproductive effort is such that the birds are really challenged by having to fly a thousand miles on a collecting trip to find enough fish and squid to feed their babies, that's going to be uh, selecting for small clutch size. If predation is really high, on the other hand, that will select for larger clutches. The parents need to, evolutionarily speaking, replace themselves over time. So 
if you have uh, if you're a mallard duck with 10 eggs in the nest and nine of them are going to die every year and that one that survives might not make it out of its uh, first winter um, that selects for larger clutches food type and availability again i'll use the albatross as an example um, albatrosses literally may have to fly over a thousand miles to collect food for their chick before returning to take over their their share of incubation. <coughs> so that may that may make it hard to um, raise more than a small number of chicks. If the parents are really long lived, wisdom being a perfect example, it's not so necessary to wear yourself out trying to wear to raise a lot of young at one time. You have more years to to be successful. And <clears throat> let's move on to color. There are evolutionary advantages for different colors in different habitats, and I'll just mention a few of them. Birds that lay white eggs. Sorry, I'm having trouble. <coughs> Birds that lay white eggs are usually nesting in cavities. And this is a barn owl. It nests in a barn um, in a secluded space. Woodpeckers all have white eggs. They're nesting in cavities. And it's dark in the cavity, right? Having a white egg helps you make sure you're not leaving some egg out uh, of, the, of the little cluster of eggs when they're inc being incubated. Pigmented eggs, those that have just a solid background color with no pattern, um, that's one category of eggs that we're familiar with, with things like robins and bluebirds. Those pigments come from biological processes in the body that are basically recycled to produce pigment that's applied in the uterus during that last 20 hours uh, before the egg is laid. So factors that determine egg color have to do with um, birds that lay white eggs nesting in cavities or burrows, or like with many ducks and geese, birds that cover their nest when the parent has to leave to go feed. Uh, one reason feathers are used for duck and goose nests is that they can easily be um, used to cover over those eggs when the female departs the nest. On the other hand, birds that lay pigmented eggs nest in more open habitats. They benefit from camouflage, except wait a minute, that robin's egg doesn't look very camouflaged, does it? Hmm. So why is a robin's egg blue? Well, surprisingly, it has taken a long time for ornithologists to get an answer to this question. There's, and, and as you might not be surprised, there are several answers. Number one, some of their predators, the mammalian predators, are colorblind. So if an egg is blue, the, it, it's really just sort of a gray look to the predator. But other predators like crows and blue jays, which are notorious egg thieves and egg eaters, have perfectly good color vision, better color vision than humans. And um, it would seem like that's just a flashing sign. Here I am, eat me, you know, if you're an egg, a blue egg. But scientists have learned recently that the blue color actually has protective value and protects from the UV rays of the sun. But recently, another theory has been proposed, and it's supported by experimental evidence. It seems that robins, for example, that lay blue eggs vary a little bit. The females vary a little bit in how blue the eggs are from one female to the next. Male robins choose their mates. No, take that back. Male robins assess their mates based on the amount of, of deep blue color in a nest. And if a male mates with a female that lays paler than normal eggs, he will not expend as much effort helping to raise those chicks once they hatch. How about that? 
it, it uh, determines the male's participation and reproductive effort in raising the chicks. I think that's pretty cool. Now, I call pattern something separate from color because pattern has to do with what's applied on top of, of the base color to, um, <coughs> to make the egg more camouflaged. And the way these uh, patterns are applied is by a separate set of uh, pigment cells in the uterus and the the egg rotates or turns while it's in the uterus and those cells are active at that time producing black pigmentation like the myrrh eggs on the left or greenish dots or you know can be various colors of usually beige brown purplish and black and one ornithologist said it's as if innumerable brushes hold still while the canvas moves, which I think is a beautiful analogy. What this can do is to make the egg more camouflaged. It blends in with the background better, but it also permits a bird to recognize its egg from other birds' eggs. Now, if you're a mer, these mers are seabirds that nest on cliffs, and they nest cheek by jowl next to each other. When you come back from a feeding flight and you want to feed or you want to sit on your egg and not your neighbor's egg, this helps that myrrh identify its own egg from all the others on that same cliff. Shape is another parameter that varies among eggs, and it can vary, it can range from just almost a perfect sphere like these owl eggs to the very pointed one. And you should not be surprised that it's the mer egg that is not round. And I bet you can imagine why, given a flat, smooth cliff that that mer egg is deposited on. And oh, by the way, they don't make a nest. Okay, size of eggs. They look at the difference between the weight of an ostrich egg and the weight of a hummingbird egg. Um, I'm sure somebody has calculated how many hummingbird eggs could fit inside one ostrich egg. It's some hundreds, thousands, I don't know. Most eggs, though, um, weigh from 2 to 11 percent of the female's body weight. And that would be like in the case of a robin with four or five eggs in a nest. The five eggs together would weigh from 2 to 11 percent of the female's body weight. But you have to admire the kiwi. This is that flightless bird in New Zealand that I mentioned earlier. It lays one egg per year, and its egg, as you can see in this radiograph, is so enormous. And just to make sure you see the egg, that's the size of the egg in the body of this bird. It weighs 25% of the body. That, that's like, what, a 120-pound woman having a 30-pound baby. So think about that. <laughs> All right, step three in the reproductive process of birds is incubation. I'll say just a little bit about this. It has to be nearly constant. Those eggs must be kept at right around 99 degrees for <clears throat> the length of the incubation period. Failure to keep that steady temperature means death of the embryo. And it's really a remarkable thing if you think about it. You've watched chickadees and cardinals and other birds at your feeders, and you see how they don't stay in one place for one time. <clears throat> They're constantly on the move. And compare that kind of typical non-breeding behavior with a behavior of incubating eggs where these birds, one at a time, sits on a nest for hours. One to two hours, even for small birds, is a huge length of time to sit motionless in one place. It's such a different behavior from the behaviors they exhibit for the entire rest of the year. And this can only happen from the influence of hormones that, that cause a broodiness, it's, it's really called broodiness, um, to 
take over at the right time so they will be you know kind of cool and calm and chill sitting on those eggs for that period of time here's a fascinating thing about the incubation stage it's only during that time of of, of the year when the birds that incubate, whether they're the females only or the males as well, develop what's called a brood patch. Um, the brood patch is an area in the abdomen that will be pressed against the eggs. And when incubation starts, those feathers drop off. They fall out. And if you have a bird in a hand and you blow on it, with your uh, with your mouth, you just you know big breath of air and blow on the belly, you'll see this patch of naked skin. Since feathers are nature's best insulator, it would be hard to transfer heat from the parent to the eggs if you had feathers in the way. So this gets rid of the feathers, and the heat can be applied directly to the eggs. Very efficient, and that's an. Uh, Eastern bluebirds brood patch, the abdomen develops more blood vessels and swells up a little bit, fluid collects, and uh, it kind of wraps itself around the eggs more effectively. Who incubates, male or female? How long does incubation take? And does incubation start with the first or the last egg? So here's a little chart for you. In all species of all families of birds, there are about 170 or 80 families of birds in the world. Over half of the families of birds, the uh, male and female, both contribute to incubation. In about a third of the species, sorry, this is families, the female only will incubate. Only about 6% of families of birds have species in which the male alone incubates. And there are 5% of families in which it's variable among the species. So the typical strategy is either for the male and female to contribute together or the female alone to do the work. Length of incubation. Okay, this varies uh, a lot, as you'll see. The shortest incubating time comes with some of the woodpeckers where the chicks are ready to hatch in 10 days. Most songbirds, bluebirds, robins, cardinals, brown thrashers, take between 12 and 17 days. Your standard domestic chicken egg, 21 days, and ducks and geese, 28 days. The, on the other end of the scale, the um, award winners for longest days of incubation would include the ostrich, 42 days, but the big winner are albatrosses and the kiwis. And that's almost three months for hatching an albatross egg. It takes that long for those pretty sizable embryos to develop in those big eggs. Now, you, people often think that as soon as an egg is laid in a nest, the birds begin to incubate. And if you've watched bluebird boxes, if you've monitored the progress of uh, cardinal egg outside your window, you um, may have noticed that at first, that's not the case. When the first egg is laid in most birds, it just sits there until the clutch is complete. So there are two options. A bird can start incubation after the first egg is laid or after the last egg is laid. There's no in between. It's either after the first egg or after the last egg. And the question is, why there, this difference have evolved. So I'll mention several things. If you're an open nester, like um, ducks and geese out at the edge of a pond, uh, laying a large clutch, they wait till all the eggs are laid before they hatch. And if you think about it, since the uh, chicks of ducks and geese and, and chickens are precocial, meaning when they hatch these mallard ducklings, their eyes are open, they can walk, they're fully covered with down, and they can swim. They leave the nest all together on the one 24-hour period when all the eggs hatch at the same time. Now, remember that how many 
days does it take for an egg to be produced? One egg a day. So if this mallard had 24 egg, uh, ducklings, how many days did it take for her to lay all those eggs? 24 days. That means the first egg laid stayed in that nest for 23 days and it still hatched at the same time as the others because she didn't start sitting on them until egg number 24 was laid. I think that's pretty neat. They have to hatch simultaneously, precocial chicks. And <clears throat> on the other hand, snowy owl chicks are not precocial. They do have down when they are hatched, but they're totally helpless. Parents have to bring them food. And um, the reason for beginning nesting, sorry, incubation, when the first owl egg is laid is this. There is a great variation from year to year in how many rodents, specifically lemmings, are available in the environment where a particular snowy owl lives because lemming populations fluctuate on about a three to four year cycle. And it's either feast or famine, almost literally. In years when there's feast, when the lemming population peaks, they those snowy owls can raise 10 or 11 chicks in one year from one nest. The next year, the lemming population may have crashed and those owl parents, the same parents, may only be able to raise one or two owlets if they're lucky. So by starting incubation with the first egg, that chick has an advantage over its siblings in later laid eggs because it will hatch a day earlier than all the others and there will be stair step increases in you know when these uh, chicks eventually hatch and it will compete for the most food and if, if the food is scarce that one chick will be sure to survive at the expense of its siblings that's nature all right um other specific incubation behaviors include turning eggs so that they're evenly warm. Uh, eggs in the center are moved to the outside. So all this is designed to increase the percentage hatch rate in a nest. Fourth step in the process is hatching. There's not too much to say about this. Parents don't help birds hatch. The, the little chicks have to do this on their own. It's sink or swim. If they can't get out of the shell, the parents won't assist. The first sign that an egg is ready to hatch is pipping. Pipping is this little hole made near the larger end of the egg as the chick makes its first penetration through the membrane and through the shell to get access to more oxygen more quickly. Pipping hat starts 24 hours prior to hatching. There's a hatching muscle on the back of chicks that's present only in early development, uh, that you know, right before the time that they hatch. And it's designed to make the chick's head move upwards, up and out, so that they're pressing against the shell from inside with the tip of their beak. Now you may have thought that birds have no teeth. Scarce as hen's teeth is the um, expression, but I beg to differ, although only in a modest way. This little white structure is called an egg tooth. It's present only in chicks for uh, three or four days before they hatch, and it falls off two or three days after they hatch. But you can see how this little pointy thing right here is perfectly designed to poke through a shell from the inside so that that chick can take its first gulp of oxygen. That's the egg tooth. The last stage in the uh, reproductive period is the nestling period where the parents are either, if their chicks are precocial, they're taking them to an environment where the chicks can easily find food. If the chicks are not precocial, they're called altricial, naked, blind, and helpless at birth. and totally dependent on the parents for keeping them warm and bringing them food. 
parental investment is really intense at this point in time. This is probably the most stressful time in the annual cycle for adult birds. The rate of feeding is really remarkable um, in many species. And I'll also talk about fecal sac removal at the end of the talk. Get it? All right. Albatrosses that have to fly, fly hundreds or thousands of miles feed their chicks once every two or three days. Uh, same with those emperor penguins, even longer times go between feedings for those. Um, one or two times a day in seabirds, gulls, terns, petrels, etc., and swifts and large raptors. Our songbirds typically feed four to 12 times per hour. And some others, just to give you some examples, barn owls bring 10 mice per night to their nest. Bald eagles bring four fish or uh, roadkill or whatever four times a day. But I like the records here. A house wren, those stick nesting uh, builders that can nest in bluebird boxes. The record was 491 trips in one day where parent birds brought food. But some relatives of titmice in Europe, 990 trips per day. So somebody sat there and watched or recorded all the activity at a nest, and that's what they found. Um, what do they feed their chicks? Well, I put this slide in to show that it's really important to grow native plants for birds because uh, even seed eating birds like cardinals have to have access to caterpillars and other insects for their chicks. If you fed sunflower seeds to baby cardinals, what would they be missing in their diet? Protein, right? Caterpillars are juicy, they provide water, and critically, they provide protein. And without protein, those baby birds can't grow their muscles and bones and everything. All the tissues require protein. Um, native caterpillars survive only on native plants. A chickadee eats or, or consumes um, for their chicks, provide five to 9,000 caterpillars in each brood. And um, I think that's a real selling point for the value of native plants. I'm going to end with fecal sac removal. This is a really amazing behavior. Imagine that you're a bluebird pair and you have six chicks in an enclosed box and it's warm in the summer and those chicks are eating four to 12 times per day and they're producing a lot of waste. That could get really nasty inside that box really fast. So evolution has provided an answer in the form of a package of their waste material into a cute little sack called a fecal sack. And the, the uh, parents arrive with a caterpillar in their mouth or a bug. They feed the chick, one of the chicks, whoever begs the loudest. And that chick usually lifts up its little butt and out pops a fecal sac. Here's a camera shot inside a bluebird box of the male changing the diapers, as I like to call it. The male birds picking up the fecal sac after having delivered some food. Well, that takes us through the reproductive cycle of birds. Uh, lots of steps involved, lots of things can go wrong, but it's a fascinating challenging wonderful time of year to watch birds doing going through this um, as we speak and i thought you might be interested in some resources in case you were uh, trying to identify a nest or eggs of um, birds in your yard or something you come across um, the peterson field guide series produces lots of field guides of different aspects of birds and other wildlife as well. Um, this one was last revised in 1998. But look, this August, they have a new edition 
and I'm interested to see this. Um, it's been a long time since there's been a, a new uh, field guide to bird nests. I keep a copy of this handy because it's nests, eggs, and nestlings of North American birds. Um, they're not all illustrated in color, but they're all described. And uh, as I say, I keep this handy when somebody has a mystery egg they'd like me to identify. So that's the end of this presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, I wondered if there were any questions. If, you're, if you have a question, um, there's only point one question in the chat that came early, but unmute yourself and go ahead and ask or type it in the chat box. Um, the question came from, or the question is, are you talking two or four eggs a year when you were talking about the number of eggs that each bird lays? Uh, that's a good question. And the answer is it can, can vary. For instance, uh, an, an albatross will have only one egg per year. In fact, only one egg every other year. But when I mention, say, two eggs in a hummingbird nest or a dove nest, that's per clutch. They can have more than one clutch per year. Um, truth be told, with hummingbirds, it would be unlikely that they would make a second nest unless their first nest was lost for some reason, weather or predator or whatever. Uh, if it was lost early enough in the nesting season, they could re-nest and they'd lay two more eggs. With bluebirds, um, the first nest of the season often has the most eggs. So the first nest might have five or six eggs. The second nest, after those were completely uh, grown and fledged, the chicks were independent, uh, might have four or five eggs. The third nest, and bluebirds can have three successful nests because our summers are long enough, might have only three eggs. So the female's reproductive effort decreases. She just runs out of energy to make, to, to produce a lot of eggs, but um, I'm referring to a number of eggs per clutch. Then I had a question in reference to, if you find a nest, how do you know whether it's occupied or unoccupied? Um, if the nest is just being constructed or has just finished being constructed, you don't know whether that's a nest that's going to have eggs in the next couple of days or whether it's a nest that um, has already been through the whole cycle and the chicks have fledged. You can usually tell that there will be some um, signs of, of uh, poop in the nest because the birds, the chicks, once they get older, stop producing the fecal pellets, fecal sacs, mm. and they do poop in the nest. And you can tell a, a well-used nest by the presence of poop or insect carcasses or whatever, but not always. And um, so you just have to be patient and wait a few days to see if that nest is just at the beginning stage or at the very end. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. There is a ne the next question is, do birds reuse the nest year after year? Good question. Um, some birds do. Eastern Phoebes, which are a flycatcher, um, they can nest around houses, will reuse their nests occasionally. And somebody did a study on this and they found that um, the females saved effort, saved energy by not having to build a new nest from scratch if they reused a previous nest. But the downside was the used nests had more ectoparasites, had more um, you know, bugs of uh, mites and lice and things like that, even blood sucking flies. So it's a trade-off, and uh, most Phoebes build a new nest each time, but it's not 100%. Other birds, like the bald eagles, they're going to reuse their nest every year unless there was a tragic failure at that site, and then they'll go some, somewhere else. And that's true for um, a lot of the raptors, the bigger birds, but small birds, almost always have to build a new nest 
every year. And in fact, if you watch bluebird boxes, if there is the first nest of the season and that completes the cycle and the chicks fledge, if you don't clean out the box, what do the bluebirds do? They don't just use that nest, they build a second nest on top. So it's part of the uh, getting the parents synchronized to reproduce um, and, and lay fertile eggs that they have to go through a nest building stage to do that right. It's in the chat here, it says, Lynn, why don't you tell them about the nest you found with a dead male bluebird contained <laughs> in the nest? <laughs> so interesting. So with that, I'm, I'm interested. Well, when I was at Guilford College, um, for years and years, I had my ornithology class monitor bluebird boxes on campus. I had a bluebird trail, quote unquote, on campus, and each student was assigned a separate box to monitor. And one year, there was a box that happened to be right outside the biology department, right outside the window of the lab I was teaching in, in fact. And uh, at the end of the, the season, because um, the semester always ended in the spring before all the reproduction was over. So, so summer would come and I would eventually go around and clean out all the boxes on campus after the semester ended. So I'm cleaning out this box and I pull out the nesting material and this blue color catches my eye and I look carefully. This male bluebird had died and its body had been incorporated into the nest on top of the first one that was in the box. Wow. And there it was all preserved in the nest. And so I did put that as part of the collection of nests that we have in the ornithology lab. And if we were meeting in person, I could show it to you. Oh, maybe next time. <laughs> uh, here's another question. Why do wood ducks nest high in the trees? Um, it's one of those questions that you answer by saying it's a way to uh, avoid being like every like lots of other species of ducks that nest around the edge of the pond. It gives them an extra measure of protection big time. Uh, and they they have those big clutches of eggs, though, because those little ducklings have to jump uh, in the, the first day that they hatch or maybe early in the second day, they jump. 20, 30, 40 feet to the ground and just without being able to fly. I mean, it's just like dropping one from 40 feet up. And it's a, the reason they do it is that it's a safe place to nest. Um, you can actually build wood duck boxes and put them up in your pond if you had a pond. Uh, but there is a risk of having those little ducklings not make it, but they're so light, they just bounce when they land. I've seen videos. Boy. Well, that seems to be all the questions. And we thank you so much for doing this today. It was so fascinating. Oh, good. Again, I will uh, make every effort to get this on YouTube in a timely fashion. So <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. It was fun.